All right, Romans chapter 15, <clears throat> and I'm going to begin reading at verse 14. Romans chapter 15, verse 14, and then I'm, I'm going to read to the end of the chapter. So Paul writes, I myself am satisfied about you, my brothers, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and able to instruct one another. But on some points I have written to you very boldly by way of reminder, because of the grace given me by God, to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles, in the priestly service of the gospel of God, so that the offering of the Gentiles may be acceptable sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In Christ Jesus, then, I have reason to be proud of my work, for I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me, to bring the Gentiles to obedience by word and deed, by the power of signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem all the way around to Arilicum, I have fulfilled the ministry of the gospel of Christ. And thus, I make it my ambition to preach the gospel, not where Christ has already been named, lest I build on someone else's foundation. But as it is written, those who have never been told of him will see, and those who have never heard will understand. This is why I have so often been hindered from coming to you, but now, since I no longer have any room for work in these regions, and since I have longed for many years to come to you, I hope to see you in passing as I go to Spain, and to be helped on my journey there by you once I have enjoyed your company for a while. At present, however, I am going to Jerusalem, bringing aid to the saints. For Macedonia and Achaia have been pleased to make some contribution for the poor among the saints at Jerusalem, for they were pleased to do it, and indeed they owe it to them. For if the Gentiles have come to share in their spiritual blessings, they ought to be of service to them in their material blessings. When, therefore, I have completed this and have delivered them uh, delivered to them what has been collected, I will leave for Spain by way of you. I know that when I come to you, I will come in the fullness of the blessing of Christ. I appeal to you, brothers, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit, to strive together with me in your prayers to God on my behalf, that I may be delivered from the unbelievers in Judea, and that my service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints, so that by God's will I may come to you with joy and be refreshed in your company. May the God of peace be with you all. Amen. All right, so I'm pleased to announce that this is the long-anticipated day. The day you've been longing for. The day we are coming to an end in our journey through the Book of Romans. This is the final session. Hold your applause. I've stressed many times that Romans is a, uh, a mixture of weighty theology and evangelistic intensity. If you, don't, if you take nothing else away from these studies, I, I hope you take that, that theology matters. It is important what one believes about God, about man, about sin, about Christ, and about the scriptures. Yes, we can invite people to trust in Christ. But who is this Christ that we are inviting people to trust? Because not everybody shares the same opinions, and the Bible is very clear on who Jesus actually is. In our day of confusion, with all the voices we hear around us, we need to know more and not less. Theology is not at odds with evangelistic fervor. People must trust Christ to be saved. But they must know that they need to be saved. And they must know who this Jesus is who saves. Not some figment of somebody's imagination. So whatever you want to call that, knowledge, that that precise knowledge, whatever you want to call that, you can call it theology, because that's what it is. Um, and I also have the idea that the Book of Romans, as well as other, as well as other books that we study, 
were not originally read and received the way that we handle these books. Uh, I mentioned this yesterday at church. I think uh, the Christians at Rome likely had this letter read to them <clears throat> all the way through at one time. When Paul wrote this letter to, to Rome, to the church there, no doubt the, the person, uh, somebody was taking, took that letter and opened it and read it all at once to those Christians who were there. Now, it's quite likely that they had referred to it then repeatedly for a long time after that, but they probably got it, had it read to them at one sitting. Um, I'm not sure that we uh, kind of grasp the whole message by handling these things the way we do. I mean, you know, I've been, been looking at Romans here for a long, long time, and we kind of forget the beginning when we get to the end. Um, but maybe that was the intent all along. But uh, last time, we saw the ministry of Christ to the Gentiles uh, in verses uh, 8 through 13. And we noted in verses 8 and 9 that Christ came to minister to the Jews. He mentions them. He calls them the circumcised. Uh, Christ came to confirm God's promises to the patriarchs. And then the result, uh, the intended result, is that the, the Gentiles may with the Jews glorify God. In verses 9 through 12, as we looked last time, uh, there's a quotation uh, from the Old Testament, from the book of Isaiah, actually in verse 12, show that the promises given to the patriarchs included the Gentiles. The inclusion of Gentiles, which is us, non-Jewish people, the inclusion of the Gentiles was not an afterthought. You know, some people had this idea that Jesus came and presented himself as the Messiah, the King of the Jews. And if the Jews would have accepted, then everything would have been great. But something happened that was unplanned for and unexpected. The Jews did not accept the Messiah. They rejected him, and they crucified him. So in a strange sense, I mean, I did, nobody says it like this, but it kind of the impression you get, in a strange sense, then God had to say, okay, well, then I need a plan B now. So my plan B is going to take the gospel to the Gentiles, and I'll deal with the Jews later on, but now it's going to be the Gentiles because an unanticipated rejection took place. It's never been a thing. It's always been. If you look at the covenant that God made to Abraham, that all the nations of the earth would be blessed through him. It has been always, always been God's plan to include the Gentiles in his saving purposes. So that's Christ's ministry to the Gentiles. So now we move, as we close here, to Paul's ministry to the Gentiles. We saw Christ's ministry to the Gentiles, now Paul's ministry. And uh, in verses 14 and 15, he says that his ministry is by the grace given me by God. I think Saul of Tarsus was never far from the memory of the Apostle Paul. Because remember who he used to be. I saw a little... Uh, a little meme somebody put on Facebook yesterday. Imagine the saints who were cheering when Paul entered heaven, the same ones that he had persecuted and put to death. Imagine that. What an amazing thought that is. And I think that Saul of Tarsus, that person that he used to be, was never too far from his memory. He always seemed to have that there. It was enough that Saul was saved <clears throat> and transformed by an encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. But for Saul, he didn't just say, God didn't just save him, but Christ called him and used him. And so he says in verse 14, he says, I'm confident that these believers then, um, th that you have the grace of God with you as well, and you are able to admonish one another. Interesting passage in verse 14. I myself am satisfied about you, my brothers, that you yourselves are also full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and able to instruct one another. They're filled with goodness. That means the uprightness of heart. Speaks of how their, their standing in Christ translates into godly character. And they are filled with knowledge, not academic knowledge. He's not saying that they were scholars but they had knowledge of God and knowledge of his word. 
and as such, they were able, and that's the word there. He says, you are able to do this. And that's the standard New Testament word that expresses ability and competence. And they were able to instruct or admonish. That word means to put in right thinking. Christians must instruct one another and admonish one another with the truth that is in Scripture. This is biblical counseling. We think of biblical counseling as something that, well, you know, you uh, you, you, you got to be trained in that. You just can't do that. You know, you have to be trained in, in all of these things. Listen, um, this is not some kind of a therapy session or anything like that for the educated few, but believers who manifest godliness and wisdom are to help one another. That's what he says here. We are all involved in instructing one another. We are all involved in counseling one another. Now, some people are much more gifted at it than others, absolutely. But Paul says that I'm confident in all of you that by the grace of God, being filled with goodness, that you have the wisdom and the knowledge of God and you have the ability and the competence to instruct or to admonish one another. Paul's ministry in this way was then by the grace of God. His ministry was centered on the gospel, in verse 16. He talks about his priestly service of the gospel of God. So he concludes the letter the way he began in, verses, in chapter 1, verse 16, centered on the gospel. And if the gospel was the main concern of Paul, it certainly should be our concern as well. And in this description of verse 16, he reminds his readers that the triune Godhead is involved in the gospel. He was a minister of Jesus Christ. He proclaimed the gospel of God, and these ones were sanctified by the Holy Spirit. So it was centered on the gospel, but it was also centered in the glory of God, in verse 17. In Christ Jesus, I have reason to be proud of my work in God. See, that's the right kind of pride. It's not a pride of accomplishment, but it's a satisfaction that one's life work of exalting Christ has been done to the best of their ability. In 2 Corinthians 10, 17, he says, Let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. He, he doesn't just say, I am proud of my work. But he says, in Christ Jesus, I am proud of my work for God. And that's the right kind of confidence, the right kind of pride, if you will. And in verses 18 to 19, it's accomplished by God's power. Everything that Paul did, whether it was his preaching or anything else, uh, was attributed to the power of God. Uh, he mentions in verse 19, by the power of signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God. Everything that Paul did, whether it was preaching or the works of power done by him, was attributed to God. In 2 Corinthians 12, 12, Paul defended his right to be an apostle, and he said that he has the signs of apostleship uh, that accompanied his ministry, signs, wonders, and mighty works. And that's what indicated that Paul was an apostle. Now, we, not, we uh, need not think that these are to continue. Uh, these were the signs of a true apostle. Uh, and the signs of an apostle, this, this, how can I say this? The signs of an apostle were not to show the power of God on him. The signs of an apostle were to show the power of God on him. You see the subtle difference there. It's not about us. I mean, there are people running around claiming themselves to be apostles. And uh, a lot of it is so that people will exalt them. And that's not uh, what Paul was saying here. The goal here is to bring the Gentiles to Christ, not to establish his own name, 
and not to gather a following. I think modern preachers need to remember this. And then he says his goal was to bring the Gentiles to obedience, <clears throat> which is kind of an interesting way of, of stating that. Obedience does not merit our salvation. And Paul was living proof of that. He said he was more righteous than anybody else. But obedience is so intertwined as a result of genuine conversion that it almost seems synonymous. That converted people, people who are saved, are people who have a heart for obedience. And so when Paul says, I'm striving to bring them to obedience, he wasn't making legalists out of them. But he was uh, attempting to give them the gospel so their lives would be transformed and they would now live a life of obedience to God instead of disobedience to God. And then we find the Gentiles' ministry to the Jews in the rest of the chapter, verses uh, 15, uh, 25 to 33. Uh, the Jewish believers in Jerusalem were in need, and Paul uh, collected financial aid from the Gentile churches to take to them. He talks about that um, in verse 25. I'm going to Jerusalem bringing aid to the saints, because there are poor saints at Jerusalem. Why were there poor saints at Jerusalem? Well, some have mentioned that maybe it was the result of persecutions that we read of in Acts chapter 8. And Paul instigated that one, actually. And maybe in chapter 12 and verse 1. Some have suggested that this poverty might have been complicated by the fact that we read early on that they gathered everything together, they sold all their stuff, and divided it amongst themselves. We read about that in Acts 